Thank you, uh, Brian, and uh, uh, thank you all for being here today on the first nice afternoon in a few weeks. Um, I learned about Ibn Khaldun from our colleague Otto Homo, who uh, mentions Ibn Khaldun in his intro to IR course. And then when I kind of proudly and somewhat smugly had said to them, oh, I'm teaching a course on Islamic political theory, about which I clearly knew nothing, and Otto very immediately spotted that, said, oh, you're going to insert Ibn Khaldun. And then when I came home, I had to look up who Ibn Khaldun was. So it's been a very steep learning curve the last four or five years. Um, but uh, can we start with uh, a distinguished ex-president of the United States? Is that going to work? There he is. I studied economics in college when I was young. And I learned there about a man named Ibn Khaldun, who lived 1,200 years ago in Egypt. And 1,200 years ago, he said, in the beginning of the empire, the rates were low, the tax rates were low, but the revenue was great. He said, in the end of the empire, when the empire was collapsing, the rates were great, and the revenue was low. <laughs> Okay, um, so that was Ronald Reagan, for those of you uh, not born when he uh, said this. Um, Reagan had a, can you hear me? Is the, good. Reagan was uh, obsessed with uh, this passage. If you actually, if you Google this, you'll find six or seven um, um, press talks where he uh, gives a version of this story. He, uh, if you go into the archive of the Ronald Reagan Library, you'll find that uh, visiting high school students would get mini lectures on uh, Ibn Khaldun. Um, so this was really like probably the only thing he remembered from college, and he was really excited about it. Um, and, um, and, and maybe while his mind was going, this thing stu stu stood out even more. Um, at the very end of today's um, lecture, uh, so in 48 minutes or so, I'm going to come back to that because I'm going to tell you the story how a Midwestern um, uh, early 20th century student would have encountered Ibn Khaldun. Um, what, how, I, I think I've retraced that. And that, um, that connects us to 19th century images of Ibn Khaldun, um, which is really uh, why that's intellectually significant. Um, and also say something about uh, Reagan's passage there. So this is the passage uh, Reagan quotes. Um, in context, it's about debates whether um, if you reduce tax rates, uh, revenue goes up. Uh, some of you may know the Laffer curve or may remember that, that debate from the 80s. Um, and um, I'm going to suggest that Reagan wasn't entirely silly to appeal to Ibn Khaldun, although when you look at the fine-grained details, there's also considerable wishful thinking going on. But that uh, doesn't make it any less entertaining, I hope. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the first 10 slides or so um, introducing the political history um, leading up to Ibn Khaldun from sort of the Prophet Muhammad um, in the 7th century to Ibn Khaldun's life in the uh, 14th century, so that will be a minute per century, so somewhat superficial. Um, for some of you, uh, it will uh, really be old, old news, but I've learned that quite a few people actually are uh, not very well informed about the history of uh, 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 Islamic empire. Um, then I'm going to take a very stark moment in his life, uh, which was a meeting that he had, a two-month meeting with the most powerful conqueror of the Middle Ages, Timur, at, uh, at Timurlane, Timurlane, I think he's also sometimes known. And they turn out to have uh, meetings in Timur's tent outside of Damascus. Eventually, Timur destroys Damascus, but it doesn't halt the conversations between Ibn Khaldun and Timur. And it turns out that uh, Ibn Khaldun wrote about this in his autobiography. And we have also other eyewitness reports. So it's an extremely well-attested event. And I'm going to use that to introduce uh, some of the main features of uh, Khaldun's uh, political theory to you. 
And then I'll go into the Mukadima, the Prolegomena, or the introduction uh, that Brian may know better than I do. So all questions can be directed to Brian uh, afterwards. Uh, I'm going to give a big, uh, that's a thousand page book. And it's kind of the introduction to um, another 8,000 pages. Um, and I'm going to try to give you a kind of sense of those thousand pages by looking at two or three big uh, themes. Uh, hopefully, if there's time, um, I'll connect, um, uh, I'll, I'll say something about his views of royal authority and group cohesion, but also something about his methods of doing history, which for the longest time was a social science. Um, and some of the constraints he introduces, I think, are still part of how we think about proper methodology. Um, I put in a slide about populism, uh, going anachronistic, but I think hopefully useful. And then we'll go back into the 19th century into Ronald Reagan. That's the red map. Uh, occasionally I'll look at my watch so that I don't get too excited. Okay, so first thing I should do is I should introduce this biography by Robert Irwin, which just came out, got a lot of very good reviews, um, which is an intellectual biography of uh, Galdun's life. Um, and it's a good compliment to the Wikipedia page that you might look up on his biography. Um, I, uh, I basically follow Erwin on the biographical parts, but when it comes to the intellectual parts, Erwin and I really disagree. And I'll, I'll say maybe a bit about that later. So, Khaldun was born in Tunis, um, and in his self-presentations, he represents himself as part of an old Yemenite stock that lived in Andalusia, or a Spanish um, Islam in part, and the family had been there for 400 years. Now, I emphasize the self-presentation because there's a kind of a, a minority view that thinks that Ibn Khaldun's family never made it to Spain and were just uh, Berbers trying to enhance their prestige. And prestige is a key, key topic in his political philosophy, so it's not entirely an, an ad, a personum. It might also be something bigger. Either way, what we do know is that um, his family had been in Tunis um, since the middle of the 13th century when Sevilla uh, got conquered by the Christians again, or reconquered if you like. Um, and since then the family had been fairly prosperous and been living in Tunis. Now, um, if you go into his genealogy, and uh, uh, Khaldun himself is obsessed with genealogy, you'll see that a few generations out, uh, his uh, older, the, the, the pater, paternal line, these are all judges, uh, mayors, important uh, politicians. But starting with his grandfather, they removed themselves from politics, and both his dad and his granddad actually turned into more mystical, proto-Sufi-like uh, characters. And in a way, uh, Khaldun breaks with that for most of his life because he really enters politics with a vengeance. <coughs> And that starts, um, let me see, um, uh, after his parents die in the plague, which both hit uh, Europe and North Africa. Um, and he gets his first political appointment when he's 20. And between 20 and 45, uh, and I'll say a little bit more in a second about this, he goes from one political position to the next, increasingly more important, but also increasingly irritated that it isn't more important than he wanted. So he's constantly involved in plots, in coups. He ends up in jail several times. It's really, really uh, super exciting. Before he gets there, he spends most of his teens uh, studying. And, uh, and you can tell because all of his writings are ridiculously learned across many, many disciplines. Um, uh, at the end of his life, he is a judge, uh, says jurisprudence is very good, but he wrote in logic, he wrote in mathematics. Uh, on Sufi mysticism, etc. And uh, one of the nice factoids I can introduce is that he spent a few years of his life at al Qari. I hope somebody can pronounce that correctly, uh, the oldest university in the world, so they like to say, and founded, I was really excited when I discovered this, by a woman, uh, Fatima Al-Firi, who was herself a refugee in Fez, and, um, and she donated an, um, uh, an endowment for a mosque and a madrasa, 
and the madrasa developed into a, a, a more serious uh, educational institution. And uh, below is a picture of the existing library. Most of these buildings were actually built in the generation just before uh, Ibn Khaldun would have visited. So these, these pictures are actually pretty cool for this respect. Um, and he himself must have liked his university years because he deposited uh, the original manuscripts of his books into this library. So we still have those. Uh, which is also quite amazing. Um, another famous alumnus, when you start doing research, you really find stuff, uh, is Maimonides, the great Jewish uh, intellectual, who'd been there 200 years before, in the period that Maimonides was pretending to be Islamic. Um, so there's uh, all kinds of uh, important connections. Okay, so what I want to do the next five minutes is give an introduction to the growth um, of the caliphate and its disintegration and um, um, use some slides I actually use in my introduction to the History of Political Theory course. Um, so, at uh, 632, just when Muhammad died, um, Saudi Arabia, what we would call Saudi Arabia, or Arabia was unified for the first time in uh, recorded history. Under the successors of um, Muhammad, so these would have been people he would have known, um, most of the Middle East, a good chunk of North Africa, and a good chunk of what we now call the Stans were, uh, were conquered. It's really astonishing, especially if you realize that the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire had been around both for 800, 800 900 years, and for most uh, people living in the period, it would have been quite natural to assume they would have stayed around for a couple of hundred years more. Um, so, uh, these events in um, the self-understanding of Islamic intellectuals are really miraculous. Um, what's striking about it is that the first four caliphs were all uh, elected by unanimous consent by the community or the, male, or the males of the community. Um, and if we put a political theory term on it, these are really elective kingships. Um, and what they develop is an empire based not on nation and not on tribe, but on religion, and where politics and religion are, are, are fused in important ways. And they, at the head of it is a caliph who combines both political and religious authority. And that structure lasts under different dynasties for about um, 300 years. So it's itself, itself a very successful political experiment, if duration counts as uh, success. Uh, by the way, the story I just told is a kind of Sunni version of the story. If you're Shia, you, you don't like the thing I just said. Uh, but um, <laughs> Ibn Khaldun is Sunni, so uh, for today we'll, we can tell this as the eternal story. Um, so this is the picture of the next uh, dynasty. And um, uh, you may remember from high school the Battle of Poitiers. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, uh, the terminus of extension in Europe. Uh, but in Asia, things keep going. Um, the more important dynasty for our purposes is the next one, um, which is really the start of the golden age of Islamic culture, at least the uh, first golden age. Um, important feature that Ibn Khaldun and Ronald Reagan both liked, uh, a period of low taxes and much trade, um, uh, the discovery of Greek manuscripts and the translations of them, so the assimilation of a lot of medicine, a lot of astronomy, a lot of geography, also eventually philosophy, um, and, um, and the foundation of Baghdad. So this is really an amazing period, but if you notice on the map, North Africa is kind of an ambiguous part of the story because there's, there's Muslims all the way to Spain, but they're not quite part of this narrative. And the reason for that is, is that uh, the empire starts fracturing in North Africa. Or Africa, they used the Roman term at the time. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, uh, but throughout the period, it's uh, very wealthy and very powerful. 
but at the end of it, uh, this happens if you know the writings of Ibn Rushd, some of my students uh, read it with me, and uh, you can see that in the 11th and 12th century, the, the, uh, this empire starts to fray, and eventually Baghdad is destroyed by the Mongols, which is kind of symbolically the end of the Golden Age. Uh, lots of great things happen after, I don't want to give you another impression, but uh, as a main picture it works. Now I'm going to fast forward to a picture we could just as well use to introduce Machiavelli as we can introduce um, Ibn Khaldun. Uh, this is a Mediterranean politics and what you'll see is that North Africa has competing emirates and kingdoms. Granada is still uh, Islamic. Uh, that matters a lot for our story because the, um, if you were on the losing side of a coup or a political battle in North Africa, Granada was a good place to be in exile for a few years, plot your next, uh, next counter-attack and then come back. Uh, uh, I think Ibn Khaldun did that four times, so it's not like uh, this is a hypothetical comment, it's really a serious comment. Uh, on the bottom, uh, you can see uh, Egypt, which is where uh, Ibn Khaldun will spend the end of his life, and it will uh, be an important part of the story in a second when I get to the encounter with Timur. Um, what's a bit puzzling about Khaldun's writings is he's aware as he must, given what's happening in Spain, of the kind of revival of power of Western Europe, or Europe and more generally, but it's something he really structurally ignores in the book. Similarly, when Machiavelli tells his story, he ignores, he ignores the stuff on the other side. Um, there's, there's characters who cross boundaries. Um, Dante, most importantly, uh, talks about both sides. So it's not like they all don't know what's happening, but this is really a, a structural feature of Khaldun's writings. Um, um, okay, now let me uh, give you a sense of his political life. Um, which, which, as I said, oh sorry, uh, which really takes place, let's see if this works, uh, on this, this part, um, uh, of the Mediterranean, um, Vesta, Portugal is there. <laughs> In joke, sorry. <laughs> At least one person thought that was funny. <laughs> it wasn't Vesta, but Bali. So that tells you something. Um, so um, let's see if this works. Yeah. So between uh, 1315, 1375. So between age 20. At 45, he's a political climber, right? He comes from uh, aristocracy. He's extremely well educated, and he wants uh, he, he wants political power. He even has a period when he's in uh, one of his exiles, where he tries to turn the Sultan of Granada into a philosopher king. Uh, a famous intellectual of his time tries to warn him, says to him, haven't you read your Plato? You know this ends badly. Indeed, it does end badly, but it's not Ibn Galtun who gets murdered, but his brother. So <laughs> there's really no justice in the world. Um, um, but while in Granada, he did his first independent uh, theorizing. It's a work of logic. Uh, don't ask me about it. I haven't looked yet on it, but I'm guessing it's on supposition. Um, one other really cool bit, tidbit is, is that on one of his peace missions between Granada and uh, Castile, um, he met uh, Pedro de Cruel, who liked um, Ibn Khaldun so much, uh, as I'll show you in a second. Ibn Khaldun is the greatest flatterer humankind has ever um, <laughs> invented. And uh, he, all, he was offered uh, his family property, uh, but he declined, I think quite wisely. It wasn't a very good idea to stay there. Uh, oh yeah, I've told you this, uh, he really, he ended up in jail for failed plots or by guilt, by association, many, many times. It's really amazing he lived to tell, uh, until 45. Now what made him attractive to his political paymasters is one key skill, and that is he knew how to raise taxes from Berber tribes without getting killed and getting enough money 
to either uh, fill the coffers of state or, which is equally important, uh, uh, create a fresh supply of soldiers. Um, because the Berbers were the main soldiers for most of these uh, emirates and kingdoms who were fighting each other and internally. Uh, along the way he gets married. Uh, we know really next to nothing about his wife or daughters uh, except their tragic end, which I'll get to in a second. But then in 1375 he does something perhaps more amazing than everything else. He says enough with politics. And then he escapes to really the middle of nowhere uh, uh, in Algeria, uh, a fort hundreds of uh, kilometers from civilization. Um, and he spends the next few years, yeah, we would say on sabbatical, um, actually doing what we want to do. Uh, he starts writing this book in this fort. Um, and uh, there's no library in the fort. The only attractive feature of the fort is that it's quiet. and it has cool summers, probably. But um, I've, I've tried to find a picture of it. But despite the best efforts of the Algerian uh, tourist uh, agency, I'm not convinced any of the pictures you can find online are of this fort. So I've, I've done without them. So he spends three years there. And he writes the Mukadima. Uh, the introduction, uh, or the prolegomena, and then he returns with his wife and daughters to Tunis. And he tells the world, I have this big book, and somewhat amazing, uh, some of us really would love this kind of impact, the book grow, becomes famous at once, he gets invites to serve, uh, I guess it's an emir, maybe it's a sultan in Tunis, and he immediately also gets caught up into political infighting and another coup. And so in order to escape all of his troubles, he says, I'm going on Hajj. And, uh, and he takes the first boat to Cairo. And then he gets off the boat in Cairo rather than you know, keep going. And uh, it's quite clear he decides that's where he should spend his time. Now, in Cairo, he, um, he stays. Uh, doesn't stay really out of trouble very well. Um, he becomes a judge in the Malaki school, the, the smallest of the schools. Um, he gets appointed not because of his enemies say he's a great judge, but because he's very famous and he's a great flatterer. Right? Um, in Cairo, he ends up in jail, uh, I think, three or four more times in other revolutions, counter-revolutions. Most of the time there, in his, in his defense, he's really trying hard to stay out of trouble. Uh, most of the, so these jail times are really uh, somewhat unfair. Um, then the big tragedy happens. Um, um, his wife, his daughters, and his library all, um, all sink off the coast of Alexandria. Um, and um, yeah, clearly he's distraught. And then he does go on the hash. <laughs> it's bad to make a joke about this, but um, yeah, there you have it. <laughs> um, the next 16 years, he leads, by his standards, a fairly sedate life in Cairo as judge or uh, plotter against Sultan. Um, he goes to uh, Damascus, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a second. Um, then he completes his autobiography, which initially had been a kind of appendix to his work, but now becomes a self standing text. And he completes, or at least a rough extended second draft of the Kitab, or the Book of Lessons, the great masterpiece to which the Mokadima is an introduction. And then he dies peacefully in Cairo, which really is uh, a miracle when you think about it. Um, okay, so this I've already said. And most of his, um, his um, quasi-celebrity in the 19th century is based on this book, which is really an introduction to the much larger book. Um, okay, so what happened in Damascus? I'm more or less on time. Um, I should tell fewer jokes. Um, in Damascus, uh, which was part of the Egyptian or Mamluk Sultanate, uh, that was being um, besieged by Timur, uh, the greatest emperor of the period. And um, 
The Sultan, who's fresh because his dad had just been deposed, uh, takes uh, a couple hundred thousand soldiers and Ibn Khaldun to Damascus, sees Timur's army and decides it's really a bad idea to be in Damascus and goes back to Egypt. And Damascus is basically undefended. And um, most of the city, a uh, very wealthy merchant city, uh, surrenders um, with promises from Timur that nothing will happen. Only the inner citadel uh, uh, resists this and they get, uh, they get destroyed. As it turns out, Timur was super eager to meet Ibn Khaldun as well. So there is an a meeting is arranged in the tent of Timur. They hit it off and the next two months they chat. Quite a lot. Um, my speculation is that Timur wanted Ibn Khaldun's uh, knowledge of geography for North Africa to uh, plan the invasion. As it happens, Timur went uh, toward Turkey, uh, defeated the Ottoman Empire. This led to the interregnum in, in the Ottoman Empire, but he could have gone the other route as well. Um, um, for two weeks of the six weeks that they talked, Ibn Khaldun is writing his, uh, his geography of North Africa introductory text, and then he presents that with other gifts, and that seemed to have helped. Uh, along the way, Timur destroys Damascus. That doesn't stop the conversation. Um, uh, it's remembered in Damascus. Um, and I now want to get you to uh, this autobiographical meeting. So I've longed to meet you for 30 years. This is... Uh, Ibn Khaldun writing in his autobiography what he claims to have said to Timur. And that for two reasons. The first is that you're the supreme sovereign of the universe and the ruler of the world. And I didn't believe there has been ever a ruler like you among men from Adam until this era. I told you he was good at flattery. <laughs> right? <laughs> you're the greatest. Verily, I'm not the type of individual who merely speaks about things based on conjecture, for I'm a scholar, which in this audience I don't need to say more, and I will explain why I say this. Sovereignty exists only because of group solidarity, and the greater the number in the group, the greater is the extent of sovereignty. So this, in one sentence, is a summary of his political theory. Not the whole of it, but this is really one of the core claims he makes. Scholars in the past, and I'll return to that in a second. Scholars in the past and present have agreed that the most populous groups among human beings are the Arabs and the Turks. For present purposes, Timur counts as a Turk, which um, may be controversial. Surely you know how the sovereignty of the Arabs was established when they became united in their religion in following their prophet Muhammad. Right, so he's making a structural comparison between the power of Timur and the power of Muhammad. Right? And he's already said that Timur is better than Muhammad, <laughs> which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, right? But uh, for present purposes, what matters is the same underlying mechanism. You have a lot of people, and you have group uh, cohesion or group solidarity. This generates political power. And that, too, is uh, uh, key to the text. Now, now comes the over-the-top flattery. None from the kings of the earth, not Kusraf, nor Caesar, nor Alexander, nor Nebuchadnezzar, is comparable to them with regard to the extent of their group solidarity. So Timur and Muhammad were, the, were best when it comes to group solidarity. As for Caesar and Alexander, they were kings of the Greeks, but they, again, the Greeks cannot be compared in their greatness with the Turks. I told you there'd be good stuff, best. Though. This is really... For you. As for Nebuchadnezzar, he was the chieftain of the Babylonians and the Nabataeans. But what a difference between these nations and the Turks. This constitutes a clear proof of what I maintain concerning the king. Right? So, um, I've already said this. Timur's power is really due to two main features. One is group uh, cohesion or solidarity, and the other is numbers. And that for... Um, for um, Ibn Khaldun explains most political power. Of course, what goes into numbers of how you get the most people, how you get the, uh, the best uh, cohesion, that requires another couple hundred pages of explanation, but that's really, these are the two main, uh, main uh, variables of this theory. Um, <coughs> um, 
Moreover, he um, exemplifies here another key theme of the book, and that is, is that nomadic peoples, the Bedouins, the savages, are militarily going to be more powerful than the sedentary civilizations at some point. And in fact, in Damascus, it would have been very easy to agree with that. Damascus, one of the wealthiest places mankind had known at the moment, <coughs> Uh, succumbs without a fight because they get deserted to uh, to these tribes. Right, this is a the main theme that runs through the book. <coughs> and as I already mentioned, Muhammad's rise is treated in the same way. So we get a political theory that's both about uh, secular power and what we would call sacred or the uh, theological or religious power. They're treated similarly. Um, uh, um, and in fact, um, one of his main criticisms of the philosophers, uh, Al-Farabi uh, uh, and Ibn Rushd, in the, in the Mukaddimah, is that they spend too much time talking about prophecy, and then in fact, political power can be gained without prophecy. Right? And I'll, I'll, I put the quote online, I'll come back to that in a second. And in fact, his core message is, if you're a prophet, but you don't have arms, you get killed. And that, of course, is Machiavelli a hundred years later as well. Um, I already mentioned this. Now, you might wonder, why do I keep saying he's very good at flattery? I think I've already given you a lot of evidence, but I'm going to give you, I think, even better evidence on the next slide. So the second reason why I wanted to meet him, this Ibn Khaldun continues in his autobiography, is relates to what I've heard from the astrologers and the Muslim saints in the Maghrib. And I mentioned what I've related before in this regard. Now, astrology um, in the time is often thought of mixed mathematics, uh, so it wasn't automatically associated with superstition. Um, although, as I'll say in a second, there are good reasons to think otherwise of Ibn Khaldun, uh, and religion. And so what he does here is he's making Timur believe that Timur himself is part of a providential plan that both the stars and the saints agree will happen. Right? So that's, uh, if you know your Christian uh, story about Christ and the three sages, it's something like that. But then on Timur. Now that too is a bit of flattery, obviously, but I have better evidence for that. Because if anybody in the audience had read the Mukaddima, they would have known that Ibn Khaldun is in fact a critic of astrology. He has a whole chapter that goes the refutation of astrology, the weakness of its achievements, the harmfulness of its goals. Right? He knows astrology is 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 not uh, so silly. Fake news. Um, in fact, his argument is really interesting. He says astrologers claim that astrology is an empirical science. But the cycles of the heavens are too long to do induction on. That's his first argument why astrology won't work. Why do you have thousand year cycles? Um, the great cycles, I think, 28,000 28, years. No way you can do the kind of induction on it to have an astrology that foretells human events. Right? So that's, in fact, a good social scientific argument or scientific argument. Moreover, he argues we lack all causal knowledge of the mechanisms. Um, so, no reason to believe the astrology. He cites, um, not the Quran, but some Hadith to claim that there's a religious prohibition against um, astrology. And then finally, and this one I thought was important for this audience, he think it's politically dangerous to rely on uh, astrology because it encourages crisis thinking. And I have a nice quote about that. Uh, I thought it was important too. Um, further, astrology often produces the expectation that signs of crisis will appear in a dynasty. This encourages the enemies and rivals of the dynasty to attack it and revolt against it. We've personally observed most, much of the sort. He probably was involved in some of it himself. It is therefore necessary that astrology be forbidden to all civilized people because it may cause harm to religion and dynasty. Right, so if you institute astrology as part of your political life, you encourage people to look for the next big event. The next big event may be a crisis point, and that undermines stability and order. 
Right? So there are really four different kinds of arguments here why astrology is as bad. And that's why I think that when he was standing in front of the greatest savage killer of all time, he decided to bluff or flatter. Okay, how am I doing on time? I have about 20 minutes left, is that right? Good. Um, so what I want to do next is tell you a bit more about royal authority and group feeling. Um, give you a minor summary of the Mukadima. And then if I have time, I want to talk a bit about his concept of history, which uh, opens the door to Spinozism and radical enlightenment and then closes it as quickly as it's opened. And then close with uh, uh, um, the, the orient Orientalism and Reagan. So, um, yeah, this is from the first main chapter of the Makadima, um, and this is the explanation, conceptual explanation, of why um, central authority is needed, according to him. When mankind has achieved social organization, as we've stated, and when civilization in the world has thus become a fact, people need someone to exercise a restraining influence and keep them apart. For aggressiveness and injustice are in the animal nature of man. The weapons made for the defense of human beings against the aggressiveness of dumb animals do not suffice against the aggressiveness of man to man because all of them possess those weapons. You go out of the state of nature into society with technology and then weapons become the great equalizer and that, if you're Hobbesian, then generates a new kind of state of nature. Right? Given that, you need a, um, a ruler. There's something else is needed for defense against the aggressiveness of human beings toward each other. Now this person who exercises a restraining influence therefore must be one of themselves. It can't be an animal, it can't be an angel. Um, he must dominate them and have power and authority over them so that no one of them will be able to attack another. This is the meaning or ground or explanation of royal authority. Right? So it solves a very, very bad coordination problem. Um, it has thus become clear that royal authority is a natural quality of man which is absolutely necessary to mankind. Nothing supernatural about it. This proposition of the philosophers who claim it requires prophecy is not necessary as one can see. Existence in human life can materialize without the existence of prophecy. Through injunctions, a person authority may devise on his own or with the help of a group feeling that enables him to force the others to follow him whenever he wants to go. This in contrast with human life in a state of anarchy with no one to exercise a restraining influence. Now, uh, the key move, and this is um, um, a variant we don't see in early modern uh, political philosophy, though the structure is very similar, is that once people escape the state of nature, they're going to need government. Why is that? Because then the division of labor has generated weapons, those weapons are useful to hunt and, uh, and kill animals and, def and, and generate sufficient food, um, you know, the development of agriculture. Once survival has been met, those weapons become a source of evil to each other. And because weapons are a great equalizer, you're going to need somebody to put a stop to uh, a permanent civil war. Right? That's the underlying argument. Uh, it requires a key extra premise. Um, humans are inclined toward conflict and injustice. Right? He's not a he's he's a, he's not Mencius. He doesn't think we're naturally good. Um, so the bottom line for him is is that uh, what authority is required is sufficient power to overawe and keep domestic peace. Right? It doesn't have to have a monopoly on violence but it has a sufficient amount of power that you're too afraid to start uh, fighting. Now, uh, what's the role of religion in this? Uh, it meets our spiritual needs. It uh, um, uh, tells us about what happens after the end of times. Um, uh, there's no sense in which Ibn Khaldun suggests all of that's uh, uh, just a story. He thinks that's very important. He himself has a mystical strain. But from a political perspective, Religion is one of the key sources of royal authority. Right? That's the argument. It doesn't have to be there, but it's useful. Um, now, underlying it is the thought that any authority, 
presupposes willing self-subordination. That's key. And that I, I think I put on a separate slide, yes. So if you think about contemporary debates about uh, nationalism and populism and group, group think, groupisms, you have a kind of critique by liberals and cosmopolitans and anti-populists that quite correctly uh, worry about the threat these philosophies and isms may uh, generate to internal and external outsiders, right? Um, you have the defenders of nationalism who see in it, in it uh, a great means toward embracing difference. Um, but what I think is distinctive about Codoon's uh, uh, analysis is that uh, group solidarity, group cohesion, group sympathy, in my terminology, um, allows a leader to have followers who willingly subordinate themselves to their, to his, uh, uh, his opinion. Um, and I think uh, self-subordination is under-theorized contemporarily. That's, I think this is actually an important uh, ongoing relevance of Khaldun's thinking. Um, now, the Mukadima is absolutely convinced that it is an original contribution to the history of intellectual thought. From the first page, it will tell you how special it is. Um, and in particular, what it proposes to do is to give us a new science in the uh, Aristotelian sense. I, I'm not going to have time to explain that today. But that is causal, self-consciously causal, and that despite the manifest reality of empirical change over time, which m might make you think that uh, uh, claims about causal claims about history as a whole would be hard to get, that at some abstract level you can make generalizations about uh, the messy uh, data of history. Right? Those are the, really the main claims. Now the book starts with the most general, it's really the first chapters about human civilization in general, it's ingredients, uh, division of labor, uh, royal authority, uh, taxation, uh, uh, soldiering, uh, how to do foreign affairs, and then the next chapter, it goes first to Bedouin life, tribal life, uh, often uh, denoted as savage. And it gives a general account of it, peppered with lots of examples. Then there's a kind of um, uh, detour <coughs> to the political, f um, the ways political life is structured in dynasties. Then he has a very long section on how uh, sedentary civilization is, and the main contrast is between chapter 2 and chapter 4. These are the two forms of political life uh, he recognizes. In civilizations, there's of course class conflict and group conflict, so these get separate treatments. Then chapter 5 is uh, basically what we would call political economy, the part that Reagan uh, quotes from. And then chapter 6 are the fruits, uh, technology, and the sciences. And you can think of the book as a kind of tree, with the roots being most foundational and most stable, and then as you go up to the, to the, to the leaves and the fruits, uh, namely the sciences and technology, that's the outgrowth of political statecraft. Right? So the book itself has uh, a, a goal, and the goal is chapter 6, namely how to enjoy the good things of life and have knowledge about it. But of course, the tragedy of the text is, is that it's extremely hard to hold on to civilization. That's really the subtext that runs through everything. Um, interestingly enough, even though the Bedouins are thought of as the savage types, they're also the, they're the agents of history in this account. Right? So on the one hand, they're, every, they're sort of kind of the other in the, in the analysis. Uh, there, what is to be feared is scary, is dangerous, uh, destroys civilization. But at the same time, they're also the vector of change, the vector of dynamism, of innovation, and of conquest. Um, good leadership, and you know, remember Ibn Khaldun's own craft at raising taxes from the Berbers, good leadership channels this dynamism 
to dynastic ends, and then if, if you get governance right, you get into a virtuous cycle of low taxes, growing populations, growing, um, growing borders, um, growing technology, growing sciences, new immigrants coming in, uh, good things happen. But uh, there's an equilibrium point, and at some point, uh, uh, either because the leadership is bad or because natural boundaries have been superseded, this thing goes into reverse, and you get a, a vicious cycle and everything falls to pieces until some Bedouin tribe is there to pick you off, hack you to pieces, and start all over. Right? So that's, that's sort of the underlying text. Now, um, if you're interested in the intellectual background of this, I think Ibn Rushd uh, Avaruas kind of had the first version of this, Polybius in the Asian world as well. But uh, Ibn Khaldun does all of this with just an astounding amount of uh, empirical evidence and data and anecdotes and, and uh, arguments. How am I doing on time, Ryan? Do I have 10 minutes or more like 4 minutes? Okay. Finish your story. Ah, I'm almost done. So I wanted to say a little bit about his, how he understands the nature of history. This is, um, sorry, is this the first paragraph of the book or the second, do you remember? Yeah, it's one of the, she took the course, so she knows the text better than I do. So this is, um, this is, I think, the first paragraph of the, of the book, the main book. History is a discipline widely cultivated among nations and races. It is eagerly sought after. The men in the street, the ordinary people aspire to know it. Kings and leaders vie for it. Both the learned and the ignorant are able to understand it. From the surface, history is no more than information about political events, dynasties, and occurrences of the remote past, elegantly presented in spice with proverbs. It serves to entertain large crowded gatherings and brings us to an understanding of human affairs. All right, so history is a spectacular um, enterprise that can really function as shared ideology, as a shared narrative, as something to be uh, collectively experienced. Um, it shows how changing conditions affected human affairs, how certain dynasties came to occupy an ever wider space in the world, and how they settled the earth until they heard the call and their time was up. Right? There's no permanence. Uh, he accepts Plato's diction that everything created will uh, perish. The inner meaning of history, on the other hand, involves speculation and attempt to get at the truth. <coughs> Subtle explanation of the causes and origins of things, and deep knowledge of the how and why of events. History, therefore, is firmly rooted in philosophy, or we might say science. It deserves to be counted a branch of philosophy. So he really has two pictures of history here the exoteric or spectacular popular kind, which entertains the high and the low, and for which there's audience demand. Right? Uh, this, but also, this part of history provides policy <coughs> advice. Right? So it's not merely entertainment, it also is instruction to the Sultan. Um, and it concerns itself as the rise and fall of empires, just as Ibn Khaldun does. Right? So it's not like he's looking down on this. Um, what's key for this history is adaptability to change. Right? Machiavelli would call this virtue. Um, um, interestingly enough, um, Ibn Khaldun doesn't coin a distinct word for this, but it uh, shows up throughout the text. Esoteric philosophical history, by contrast, aims at truth. And I think it's important to reflect on the fact when we do methodology of social science, whether our goal as policy advisors and our goals as truth seekers, whether they always line up well. If we call doing things, uh, same data, different, different practice. Right? What's striking, however, is he puts it all in the same book. Um, what, what is, what's aiming at the truth? That's causal knowledge. And uh, he gives us methods of how to get that causal knowledge. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. Um, maybe for Q&A, if there's really nothing to say, but I want to wrap up. I want to pass on to um, his rediscovery, because after he died, he had some students who kept the flame alive. He was studied 
uh, actually in the Ottoman Empire quite a bit in the 17th and 18th century, but um, he was not for a couple of hundred years part of the canon, which is itself an interesting fact. He got uh, the first mention of him in, um, in a Western European uh, context is actually Leiden, uh, Choleus, a professor of mathematics and um, Arabic, published a biography of Timor. And in the Timor biography, uh, the author um, Ibn Arab Arabisha relies quite a bit on Ibn Khaldun's autobiography, even though Ibn Arabisha was also an eyewitness to the event. Right, so this is the first account. Now, why do I tell you that? Because it's really super esoteric knowledge. Uh, number one, Golius was one of Descartes' best friends. And Golius was probably a teacher of Spinoza. Right, so if you're going to explore similarities and differences between Spinoza and Ibn Khaldun, there's actually an intellectual pathway for which you can do that. This was the discovery of last week that had me excited. Okay. <laughs> um, Ibn uh, Khaldun only became a big deal in European thought uh, 300 years later, 200 years later, in what is now known as French Orientalism. For reasons that I don't quite understand, uh, except for Renan, all the great French Orientalists, or if you agree with Said, all the evil Orientalists, they all had an obsession with Ibn Khaldun. They all did translations and editions of it. Um, you can see once that got started, why that was uh, exciting to people. He provides all these detailed geography and political history of these lands that are going to be conquered or should be conquered according to the French. He also provides a kind of mental map as um, anticipation of the then developing social science. So what you see in the 19th century and 20th century is comparisons with Durkheim, with Weber, uh, with Adam Smith. That becomes a kind of trope of late 19th century thought. And Ibn Khaldun gets kind of reinvented as an anticipation of all of that, fairly or not. Now let me give you the final part of the story, and then I'll, I'll end. How does Reagan find out about it? Well, it turns out it was a Belgian scholar, Ernest Nice, a uh, professor of international law, in fact, one of the great late 19th, early 20th century uh, uh, founders of international law uh, in the modern sense, who himself had an extremely esoteric set of interests. One thing I discovered is, uh, oh, sorry, bad news, he also likes imperialism. Uh, <laughs> important to mention always. Um, oh, yeah, that doesn't work, okay. Um, one amazing thing is he wrote a monograph on one of the earliest female political theorists, uh, Christine de Pizan. Um, so Nice was himself really uh, broad. But the text that uh, I'm interested in is his history of uh, political economy. Um, a French text, but it got translated into English. And that text, which is really a history of uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century political economy, what do you guess the first chapter is on Ibn Khaldun? That all of the stuff he's going to be telling us about has already been anticipated and very interestingly analyzed by this great Egyptian thinker. Notice Egyptian thinker, because that's how Reagan understands him. Now, he treats uh, Ibn Khaldun primarily as a theorist of governance, uh, which itself uh, um, is worth noting. Now, Nice, so this text, his researches in the history of economics, was the leading textbook on the history of economics for a generation. And when Reagan was a student in Eureka, Economics and sociology would have been taught as history of political economy. That's just the way they taught it. So it's not impossible that uh, Reagan encountered Nice as a textbook in a classroom. That would be follow-up re uh, research. If you may recall, the late 20s and early 30s are a time of depression in uh, America. And tax policy is very much something you'd be debating in the period. So there's, in fact, uh, a direct link. I'm going to remind you of the passage. Reagan claims that 
tax cuts can generate more revenue than they cost. He then goes on to cite Ibn Khaldun, this Egyptian. Um, and this is what Nice writes. Most of you know your French. My French pronunciation is terrible. Um, but um, at least my mom's not that funny. Um, but I, I think it's a fairly good translation, right? So there are two options. Either um, a speechwriter of uh, Reagan thought this was the sentence he needed to memorize. But that's really peculiar because at this point that's a hundred year old sentence. Or it's one of those things that lodged in Reagan's mind and press play whenever he had a chance to press play. So that's, uh, that's my story for today. Thanks for your attention.